Well, Arturo, it's it's wonderful to to welcome you here. If, uh, those who followed Arturo's work know that he's a legend, and we're so grateful for you to be here. He's an activist researcher from Cali, Colombia, working on territorial struggles against extra extractivism and working on post, -dev post developmentalist and post capitalist transitions and ontological design. He was professor of anthropology and political ecology at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill until 2018, and is currently affiliated with PhD programs in design and creation and in environmental sciences in Colombia. Over the past 30 years, He's worked closely with Afro-descendant and environmental feminist organizations in Colombia. He's most well known for his book, Encountering Development, The Making and the Unmaking of the Third World, uh, published in 1995 with the second edition published in 2011. And his most recent books are Designs for the Pluriverse, Radical Interdependence, Autonomy and the Making of Worlds, 2018, and more recently, Pluriver Pluriversal Politics, The Real and the Possible from 2020. The forthcoming book, Designing Relationally, Making and Restoring Life, Restoring, Restoring Life, with Michael Osterweil and uh, Kriti Sharma is forthcoming. Uh, Why Architecture Think Tank, Cruz and Natalie, is a planetary uh, studio practicing by questioning the political, historical, and material legacy and imperatives of architecture and urbanism. Founded in Brussels during the financial crisis of 2008, by Puerto Rican architect, artist, curator, educator, author, and theorist Cruz Garcia, and French architect, artist, curator, educator, author, and poet Natalie Cruz. Um, why is one of their several platforms of public engagement that include Beijing based anti profit art space Intelligentsia Gallery and the free altern and alternative education platform and trade school called Cloud Readers? Based on the emancipated Emancipating and Persecuted Alternative Practice of Education performed by lectores like Luisa Capetillo in the tobacco factories in the Caribbean, Loud Readers is an open pedagogical platform and free trade school that engages with architectural education as a form of mutual aid and critical solidarity in the age of COVID-19. Garcia and Frankowski are associate professors at Iowa State University. Thank you, Natalie Cruz and Arturo for accepting this invitation for accepting the, also the challenge of a rather experimental form of lecture. Um, Arturo's lecture will be illustrated with images collected, arranged, um, and created by Cruz and Natalie, um, which will offer interpretations and openings of Arturo's words. Uh, and I think will lead to a really wonderful conversation. Thank you all for your uh, collaborative spirit. Arturo, Cruz, and Natalie, over to you. All right. Well, thanks so much, first of all, Nora, for the invitation to the school. It's a particularly exciting invitation for me because I, I'm very much aware that both architecture and design are becoming very interesting spaces for doing critical thinking and critical work. And uh, so it's great to be here in that, this space of the Cooper Union School. Uh, thanks a lot to Cruz and Natalie for accepting Nora's invitation uh, to do this experimental collaboration. I think it's really, really great what you have done. I hope the audience will agree with me at the end. Uh, thanks everybody who's joining us, especially special greetings to those on Radio Al Hara in Palestine and the Middle East. And uh, so let's begin. And what I would like to start by saying is we we'll start with um, talking about three relatively straightforward concepts around which there seems to be a convergence, a growing, a growing convergence, at least in critical circles and activist circles. And the first one is that we are undergoing a very particular crisis, which is a civilizational crisis, a crisis in a particular mode of existence. So we're going to talk about what is that mode of existence. Broadly, heteropatriarchal, capitalist, white supremacist mode of existence, but there is more to say about that. And that's the concept that indigenous peoples in Latin America started to introduce at around 1992 and has become widespread in the continent, in Latin America at least, 
and beyond Latin America. Um, the, uh, we may call that crisis, the Anthropocene or the sixth extinction as Extinction Rebellion, for instance, talks about that. In France, they call it collapsology or the collapse, collapsology, which is becoming a buzzword. Or in Latin America, more and more, we call it terricidio or terricide. And this is a concept introduced by the indigenous movement, the South American indigenous women, women's movement for buen vivir, for good living. And in terricide, they involve, they incorporate both the killing of the earth, the physical ecosystems, but also the spiritual and knowledge ecosystems, especially of indigenous peoples, but pretty much of everybody else. And at the root of this crisis is the idea that the, or a way of a civilizational development based on the idea that humans are separate from non-humans, humans separate from nature, and that some humans are better than others, obviously, you, sort of the separation between us and them, between Europeans and the rest, historically speaking, or Euro-Americans and the rest, historically speaking, but also the separation between mind and body, subject and object, reason and emotion, et cetera. And that's what is called ontological dualism. So this, this dualist ontology of modern civilization is in many ways at the root of this ecological crisis. And also then, if we are in a civilizational crisis, then that calls for a transition, for a civilizational transition. And here, the, from Latin American social movements, we get the idea of transitions to the pluriverse, or transitions to a world where many worlds fit. That's the definition of the pluriverse of the Zapatista of Chiapas. And that means that we have to transition from this idea of a single world, a globalized, you know, capitalistic, modern, rational, individualistic, competitive world that is becoming hegemonic worldwide. Wherever you look, there seems to be manifestations of that idea of a one world world, a world made of a single world to a world of many worlds or a world where many worlds fit. Um, I like to give you an idea of um, uh, the, the challenge of the stakes for this from a wonderful quote that really impacted me the first time that I heard it, that I read it. The quote goes as follows. It says, it is all a question of a story. We are in between stories. The old story, the account of how the world came to be and how we fit into it is no longer effective. Yet we have not yet learned the new story. The prevailing story, which is the story of the Judeo-Christian tradition and the mastery over nature and colonialism and so forth, as we are seeing in some of the images, has become a dysfunctional cosmology. So that story has become a dysfunctional cosmology. It functioned well for a time but it is no longer the story of the earth, uh, nor is it the integral story of the human community. It is a sectarian story. So we need a new story and we are in between stories and there are multiple stories that are emerging worldwide. So we'll talk a little bit about that. That quote is from Thomas Berry, an ecologist and theologian from North America who passed away about 20 years ago uh, in a paper that is really interesting called The New Story. So uh, the dominant, what is the dominant story? Let's talk a little bit about the dominant story. The dominant story is the story of sort of modern man, so to speak. Sylvia Winter, a Jamaican philosopher, talks about what she calls a monohumanist notion of the human, or a monohumanist mode of the human. And she argues that increasingly worldwide, but certainly within the dominant, the global north, so to speak, we are contained within this single story of the human, this single idea of the human, which is liberal, secular, bourgeois, and Western. So the human as secular, liberal, rational, bourgeois, Western competitive, et cetera, et cetera. There is a long development of why she thinks and that's the case. And what she calls for is to become aware that that's what is going on, that we are within that story of rationality and secularity and liberalism. 
And then we have to move to a different horizon of being, horizon for the human that is multiple and hybrid, sort of an ecumenical notion of the human. And so that's, that's very important. So if the first story then is the story of terricide, collapse, colonialism and inequality. The second story has to be a story that is centered on life, that is affirming of life, that enables us to weave and reweave and repair the web of life. And that's the story based on the third concept that I'm going to introduce, which is the concept of interdependence. And that's the basic idea is that we're all enmeshed within this web of interdependencies, this intricate web of interdependencies uh, that incorporates humans and non-humans and everybody and the spirits and the ancestors for many peoples. And that we have to accept that interdependence and not separation is the real foundation of life, is the real essence of life, so to speak. And hence, we have to reintegrate the human with the rest of uh, the enmeshment in which we all exist. And so this second story is the second that allows us to uh, develop a different ethics towards the earth and towards each other, an ethics of care and healing and repair of the web of life. So let's begin talking about design. So design has been central to that ontology separation. Design is a central political technology of modernity. It's central to the devastation that we're seeing. And design can also be central to a transition based on interdependence. Design can become a praxis for the healing and caring and repairing of the web of life. And uh, so, we have to start to get there. We have to realize that if the world is in crisis, then design is in crisis. And if design is in crisis, it has to construe itself. And I, I'm speaking about design and also urbanism and architecture in the larger sense of the term. If design is in crisis, it also means then that design, architecture, urbanism had to construe themselves as in transition at the service of the larger transition the largest civilizational transition. So that we, to get there, we have to develop an ontological idea of design. And why is this an ontological? Design is ontological because in designing tools, we're designing ways of being. Think about the digital technologies, how these digital devices are changing the way we are, the way we exist in the world. So design is always about ontology, it's always about ways of being and ways of doing. Let me give you other examples of why this is ontological. This one that we have now on the screen is one of the most uh, interesting and, and clear ones to me. First, 1950s suburban home housing the nuclear family, heterosexual nuclear family, celebrated civilizationally as the way to go, the model to go for the rest of the world, uh, has become, is, 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 an, is a particular way of being in space of a special, the, spe the speciality of being through this that has produced this kind of neighborhood uh, in which people exist in isolated homes, sometimes in isolated rooms within isolated homes as decommunalized individuals, as delocalized individuals and delocalized families. It's a profoundly uh, anti-ecological, anti-communal way of being. Contrast this with the most opposite example that we can think about, which is the Amazonian Maloka or longhouse. And these are from indigenous peoples in the Amazon and in other, in other parts of the world as well, in which up to 30, 40 people can live in a single space. Now, two cautions. I'm not saying that we have to go back to live in Malocas. I mean, that's obviously impossible. But uh, nevertheless, that my point is that if we exist you know, in a Maloka society, in an indigenous society, we are, uh, uh, the world we build is a world that is profoundly communalized, that is deeply connected to the earth, to the animals, to the plants, to the spirits, to the ancestors. So it's a very different way of being. So this is just a way for me to convey the idea of why design is ontological. This idea that we exist in space, but the different spe specialities enable different ways of being and different worlds to exist, different constructions of the world. 
Okay, then we can give other, other examples, but I'm going to skip all, all, the all these other examples for the sake of time. And to move on to tell you about sort of my own excitement about what's going on in design today. And uh, so, and including again, cities and architecture. I think one of the, when I started uh, researching new design, critical design studies literature, I realized that design in this literature is emerging as a very important domain for thinking about life and for thinking about the walls, the walls that we build. So design as a domain for thinking about life, for making life and making walls. And that there's a greater awareness about that on the part of critical design studies, theories and practitioners. And uh, so worldwide, we see what's happening with this critical design studies field. We see that there are different emphases in the global north and in the global south. In the global north, for instance, there's a lot of thinking about transition, about design for social innovation, about transition design, just design in the global south, decolonizing, decolonizing design, decolonial design, designs from the south, alter design, non-designs. And there is a conversation, increasing conversation between global north and global south along these trends, also in architectural studies, which I think find very, very interesting. And one of the main questions that we find is when we begin to, when design begins to conceive of itself as taking place within a living cosmos, not within an inert cosmos made of objects and subjects separate from each other, but within a living cosmos, within a living world, then uh, we arrive at the following question. This is a question yeah, something like which I participated also with Ezio Mancini, Virginia Tessinari, and other design theorists. The question is the following. Can there be a design culture and practice that stops being anthropocentric and embraces the idea of radical interdependence and also that is capable at the same time of operating in the reality of the contemporary world so how do we remake design, reorient design? So the design again enables a degree of autonomy to different human groups over the making of life, as opposed to outsourcing life to experts and corporations and the state and you know, capitalism and so forth. So it's about regaining autonomy over the making of life. And, and that's one of the most interesting trends in design. How do we uh, uh, build bridges between the transformation of design from an ontological perspective and especially from the perspective of radical interdependence or radical relationality. So what is the relevance of all of this for cities? So let's begin to think a little bit about cities. And we can start with, with this section on cities by telling you about a recent program that I heard I'm pretty sure it was on NPR, but it might have been something different, maybe a podcast or something, on the tree canopy in the Los Angeles area. And something that seems to be so seemingly simple, like the tree canopy, yeah, we know that trees are important, but this story revealed a whole different story. For instance, tree canopy in uh, the neighborhood of Watts or West LA, uh, is about 5% of the land to the territory. But if you move not far away to Beverly Hills, you find that this tree canopy is about 25%. And the importance of that is it's huge, not only in terms of heat. I mean, in, in uh, what's in East LA, West LA, we find these heat islands and heat domes. The temperature is about 20 degrees at least higher than in the more forested areas or areas with a, with a more extensive tree canopy, uh, but also the correlation between, between trees and class and income level and, and race and ethnicity that is, that is so clearly seen in the case of the Los Angeles area. So there's a lot of lessons here for urbanism uh, to take into account. Generally speaking, and if we look at history, cities were built on the basis of two historical anomalies. 
the first anomaly was the exile of non non-human living entities from the city, the exile, the exile of nature from the cities, from the Greek classic cities, the polis, the Greek polis until today. But the second is also the exile or the, the exile of the peasant modes of, of life, the countryside from the city. The cities, everything that the countryside is not, everything good happens in the city. Everything, nothing good can come from peasant way of life from the countryside. So this is a historical anomaly that today also finds its reflection in the expulsion, the marginalization from the city, the spatial marginalization from cities of so many different groups of people, not only those marked by color and race, but also vagabonds and migrants and, and, and homeless people and so forth. So that the cities then, the separation between human and non-human that is so central to the city, and hence the city are so central to, to the ecological crisis, means that cities have become, as Saskia Sassen put it, storage space for capital, and thus producing a de-urbanized city, de-urbanized cities, with the collusion and participation of many and the majority perhaps urban professionals, of urban design professionals and architects in this, in this uh, transformation of the city on the basis of ideology, ideologies of security, securitization and fear. So this is, this is the reality of the cities today, in many parts, certainly many parts of the global south, but increasingly the global north. Uh, and the, these courses offer from urbanism and planning, especially the discourses of competitive cities, smart cities, sustainable cities and so forth, they won't go far enough into the remaking of the cities because they belong with the same ontology of separation, uh, head hierarchies and mastery and control that we find in the cities. But in urban studies, there is also something that is called a relational term. I think the term was coined by Ash Amin and Nigel Thrift in London, in the UK. And uh, the relational uh, uh, shift or turn in urban studies is also very much associated with the work of Abdul Malik Simon. Many of you probably know who he is, really interesting, fascinating work, especially in cities in Asia and Africa, you know, like Jakarta and so forth. And um, and it's one of the most interesting trends in urban stories at present. So it's basically trying to see the city from below, seeing the city as an assemblage, bringing together humans, non-humans, materialities, objects, images, discourses about the city, all of that, and enabled in many ways by the distributed intelligence that comes along with socio-technical systems that are all over the city and even distributed, but nevertheless, all over the city. So that some of these researchers, uh, Laura Forlano, for instance, speaks about what she calls the rhizomatic ontology of the city. The city has a dispersed network, the rhizome, which is a much interesting, more, more interesting image than that of the network. And talking about a different epistemology for the city, seeing the city from the street level up, from the ground hum of the city, which recalls especially those of you in New York, I'm sure many of you know very well, the famous debates between Jane Jacobs and Robert Moses in the 1960s that pitted the sort of modernist grand planner seeing the whole city and transforming the whole city to this high waste versus Jane Jacobs looking at the city at the neighborhood level, at the street level uh, from below with an ethnographic uh, eye of the city always making, coming to the realization that the city is so different, very different from what planners and designers like Moses were envisaging. So this uh, tendency or trend in relational studies of the city is um, very well explained or em embodied by two recent manifestos that I encourage you all to look at which are here by uh, 
Afanina, the, the young, and the, the Bra Solomon. This is in conjunction with uh, the uh, uh, Dutch pavilion for the Venice, Venice Biennale of this year. And the manifesto, the first manifesto, uh, together the two manifestos suggest, as the catalog says, an urbanism that is female, of color, indigenous, queer, and multi-species. I'm going to repeat that because it's so fascinating. An urbanism that is female of color, indigenous, queer, and multi-species. Um, so that basic insight is that humans exist within a design space. And that, that design space in many ways have also been colonized by man, by liberal, secular, rational, competitive, individualistic man. And the more you succeed in that game, I've been that kind of human, as Sylvia Winter would say, the more you are able to command control over the city at the expense of all the multiplicity of others. So the young calls for incorporation of the multiplicity of others into the remaking of the city. And similarly with the non-human, with, with, with uh, Solomon's manifesto, which uh, is becoming obviously an important new way of thinking about everything, which is how to incorporate non-humans into, into human life again, into human worlds, into human designs. Okay. Um, so if the cities were built on this anomaly of expelling or banishing, the banishment of nature from the city, it would suggest that it, it makes it is so important today, especially in the day of climate change, to begin to re-earth the city, to reintegrate cities again into the natural fabric of life. Easier said than done, and of course, there is many ideas about this, especially from the fields of uh, urban design, ecological design, and so forth. But it is if in the hills, of the crisis of the modernist city. We accept that that city envisioned by the Charter of Athens of 1933, which is still the blueprint for most urban development, uh, is in crisis. Then what is needed is what Tony Fry, uh, Australian design theorist, philosopher, one of the main people working on ontological design calls the ontological metrofitting of cities, not just retrofitting of buildings, but the metrofitting of the entire city from an ontological perspective. What does he mean by that? And let me um, read you a second quote, and this is from, from Tony Fry. He says, if humanity has to adaptively change in order to survive, then there, there have to be ontologically designing environments that prompt and support this process. As such, the agenda of metrofitting has to explore the indetermin indeterminacy of the city, its fragmentation, its porous edges, its creative and destructive metabolism, the risks to which it is exposed, what has to be learned, what can be repaired and by whom, the politics of change and the imperative of acting in time. In sum, the remaking of cities as action and outcome is a means to our own remaking. So that there is a correlation between the remaking of the human and the remaking of cities. And this is so important. We need a new, new human for a new city, a diverse human, a multi-species human, a human with, all, with the multiplicity of others. So, this rethinking the cities from the perspective of the difference that inhabits the city, and especially from a relational perspective. There are more, much more ideas about this. Now we're seeing instances of biophilic design, and biophilic design is a growing field. There's a journal called Biophilic Design Journal, which is very interesting, um, which basically calls for endowing the cities with abundant nature. Anywhere you can introduce nature, do introduce nature into the cities in the, in the, in the way of you know, urban gardens. But that it is much more than the greening of, of the city. It has to be, again, from this ontological perspective, 
we can think at, about the, the example of Detroit, how in the new way, the last 20 years again of white flight and deindustrialization, many especially poor residents and people of color in Detroit have recovered parts of the city to build what they call agri-hoods, you know, urban agricultural neighborhoods. Uh, we can think about the super blocks, the new super blocks in Barcelona, more ambiguously, but nevertheless it's called super islas or super illes uh, in Catalan and Spanish. The redoing of these famous uh, 19th century blo super blocks, but again to make them more amenable to be used by by living neighborhoods of people and children and parks and playgrounds and so forth. And finally, maybe another example that I'd like to talk to you about. This is from my home city of Cali and a, and a, a senior colleague and collaborator, Harold Martinez Espinal, an architect from Universidad del Valle, and who talks about a new fusion between country and the city. And he, we can call that an instance of urbanization, or rural urbanization. Harold Martinez's uh, hypothesis or point of departure is that we're going through a crisis of habitability of occidental modes of dwelling and that you know middle class neighborhoods are a quintessential example of that i would repeat what i said before and in the latin american cities and in many cities worldwide still these middle class middle class enclaves of high rise buildings or single standing family homes gated, all gated with surveillance cameras, you know, with all the amenities of life, continues to be offered as the example to follow. But that such example is, to me, precisely the wrong example to uh, suggest in this day and age, because it is profoundly decommunalizing, uh, delocalized, anti-ecological, center on consumption, individualistic, and so forth. So here we have a huge design and urban planning challenge, which is how to re-earth and recommunalize and relocalize uh, you know, modes of dwelling in the city. Um, then Harold Martinez has a whole uh, sort of uh, urban proposal and design um, project to suggest ways in which we can do this, especially in the um, living quarters of more popular living quarters with uh, government subsidies and so forth, what is called subsidized housing. And to render these subsidized housings from this storage space, minimal, minimal storage space for, for people into space where food, and nature and trees and greens all coexist in the, from the apartment building itself to the surrounding areas, to the social centers and so forth. So it's, it's a fascinating um, uh, project, the one that Harold Martinez has. Now, in what remains of this, my presentation, I'm going to be talking about two other things. The first is that, is the diagram that you're seeing now, which I'd call it six strategies for redesign or for transitions to the pluriverse or six axes or strategies or six principles. And the second that we will see at the end is some propositions for pluriversal design. But before we go into the propositions, let's go back to the, to the six strategies. And uh, let me preface this by saying that this is in a way is my own reading of what is coming out of the interface between activist practice, social movements, collectives, um, and theoretical or, or academic debates. And, uh, and, and so the interface between social theory and activist practice from Latin America in particular, but I think that it applies, it could be applied for many different parts of the world. Second uh, caution before I start is that these are not in order of priority. You can start in any of them or with any of them, and you will probably eventually find the other ones. So this 
six principles are the following, the recommunalization of social life. And the first one is so important because as I was saying, globalization, especially the last 70 years of globalization and development under neoliberalism, have entailed a war of anything communal and collective. Globalization is about the creation, the systematic creation and designing of the possessive competitive individual that sees himself or herself as existing in competitive markets uh, and trying to achieve success in those terms. So if that's the case, then to recommunalize social life becomes an imperative because social life has historically been place-based and communal. That doesn't mean that there cannot be mobility. Of course, there will be mobility. Uh, a great deal of the mobility today is actually forced mobility, displacement for economic reasons, political reasons, religious reasons, ethnic reasons, what have you. But that every community in the world, or at least let's, let's talk about talking about Latin America, the US, Europe, uh, has to come up with their own particular way of recommunalizing their neighborhoods, their territories, their environments. The second one, and that's rebuilding relationality, by the way, between with humans and with non-humans. The second one is the relocalization of many activities, productive activities, uh, livelihood provisioning, uh, a great deal of even energy. There's a lot of emphasis now on localizing energy uh, within a degrowth perspective or commons perspective. So obviously food in particular is so important to relocalize food and it's, it's easier said than done because to relocalize food, especially under the paradigm of food sovereignty, of groups of people having sovereignty over the production of their own food and their own means of subsistence and reproduction means that they have to reconstitute the whole entanglement of that constitute what we call food that involves seeds and soils and water and knowledges and even recipes of how to prepare and land and territoriality. So obviously not everything will be able to be relocalized, but, but many things can be relocalized. There's a lot of emphasis on this in many transition activities like in transition town narratives. The third axis is that if we want recommunalization and relocalization to have a chance to succeed, then there has to be also strengthening of local autonomies, collective autonomies. We're talking about collective autonomies. This is not about individual autonomy. So many Latin American movements today, many movements, movements worldwide emphasize autonomy, self-determination for other peoples like native peoples, diasporic peoples talk about self-determination as opposed to autonomy. Autonomy is in a way of thinking about politics uh, that starts from the local level and then it builds horizontally as opposed to you know, vertically. The fourth axis is that the, this is come from Latin American feminisms. All of them emphasize the simultaneous depatriarchalization, deracialization, and decolonization of the societies. Patriarchy is that ontology, very old ontology, cosmovision, way of being, that is based on privileging hierarchy, control, appropriation, negation of the others, and ultimately violence and war. And patriarchy underlines capitalism, racialization, colonization in many different ways. So we have these entanglements today patriarchal, racialized, white supremacies, colonial capitalisms and globalizations. So depatriarchalization and so forth at the local level, at the community level, and then building there up is a very important axis of principle of redesigning. What does it mean for architecture? So we have to think about that. Uh, the fifth one is one of the most important, obviously, given the conjuncture of climate change, which is reintegration with the earth or re-earthing. Re-earthing the city, re-earthing uh, society in general, indigenous peoples in Latin America, some indigenous peoples in Colombia, particularly talk about the liberation of Mother Earth, because they argue that Earth has been enslaved, and as long as we are, in, as she, Earth, is enslaved, so are we, all humans as well, and non-humans. 
And, uh, and so they call on people in the same way that the women, the indigenous women proposing the concept of terricide or terricide, they call on all peoples to join in this. This is not just for indigenous peoples, it's for everybody. We all have to engage on this effort at stemming terricide, going against terricide of liberating Mother Earth, wherever we are, even in the cities. And the last one, the last axis, I'm not going to say anything about this, is precisely um, the need to build self-organizing networks among alternatives. And this is one of the most important questions today in social theory now, which is how does social change happen, significant social change? Is it possible to really make a dent on these large monsters of global capitalism and the state and so forth and armies and, and, uh, and all kinds of, of nasty uh, social actors today? And, uh, and if we give up the idea that there can be a revolution once and for all, uh, if we get, give up the liberal idea that piecemeal change by changing individual mindsets, individuals changing themselves to change institutions, to change society, is going to lead to any lasting significant transformation, then where do we go? And I think in my mind, one of the most interesting realizations is that that radical change has to be, has to start really at the level of the grassroots at the local level in multiplicity of places. And that's what is in, indeed happening. And transitions are already happening at that level because there are many transformative alternatives in so many different areas concerning food and energy and agriculture and space and architecture and biophilic design and biodesign and ecological design and, and transition towns and eco villages and commons and commoning and degrowth and so forth and so forth and so forth. That the idea of creating convergences among networks of alternatives is what is beginning to appear as a great need, both for social theory to understand how that can happen and for activist practice to foster. Okay, and I think that's, that's the, the last thing I wanted to say about this. So we can move on to the very last part uh, of, uh, and with, very short preface, I guess. This is, so what is pluriversal designing? And after Designs for the Pluriverse, I received many uh, wonderful feedback, some critiques obviously as well, which is great as well. But, uh, but a lot of people ask, well, you know, so what do we do with that, with this idea of the pluriverse, with pluriversal politics? And what you're going to, to, what we want to show you now is a, is a brief version of a longer version on some kind of quasi principles and pluriversal designing. This is a particular version that I started working on with a paper with Marisol de la Cadena recently. And it's a longer list, but for now, this is it. Let me just say that these are still relatively abstract. But the challenge for all of us, and for all of us interested in transitions, is how do we translate some of these insights from radical interdependence, from relationality as a new foundation for being and for living and for building walls, relationality or radical interdependence as the way to the, the principle that we have to adopt again if we want to regain autonomy over the making of life, as opposed to outsourcing life to do in design relationally. How do we translate that into concrete, more tangible, more hands-on designing criteria and designing uh, exercises? So this is it. Uh, Cruz and Natalie are going to be showing this and reading this for all of us. So thanks to them as well. Thank you. We will try. Um, so because of, uh, do you still have feedback, Cruz? Can we try again? No, now we're good. Point one, designing pluriversally implies designing relationally, that is, 
based on the premise that life is constituted by the radical interdependence of everything that exists. Two, designing pluriversally means designing with, in, from a, from a world of many worlds in awareness that the premise of separation negates the possibility to exist to what is ontologically different. Three, designing pluriversally places in parentheses the modern notions of representation, object and project, opening possibility to non-object-centered designing praxis. Four, designing pluriversally is mindful of the conditions of generalized individuation, de-localization, de-communalization, and the placing affected by modern forces, including urbanism and planning. Five, designing pluriversally works for the reconstitution, healing, and caring for the web of interrelations that make up the bodies, places, cities, and landscapes that we are and inhabit. It aims to heal the ontologically affected unfruitedness from body, place, and landscape through forms of making that contribute to re replacing, and re-earthing life. Six, designing pluriversally means regaining the capacity for making life autonom autonomously instead of outsourcing it to institutions, experts, the state, and the capitalist economy. Seven, designing pluriversally departures from anthropocentrism, figuring conditions for all living beings to flourish. It creates spaces for reimagining ourselves as pluriverse and community. Eight, designing pluriversally contributes to dismantle the mandate of masculinity, colonialism, and white supremacy underlying the object-driven ontology of modernity. It practices a feminist and anti-racist politics that privileges collective and communitizing modes of making and acting centered on care. Nine, designing pluriversally resists translating the inexhaustible reservoir of practice of making life, particularly both from the global south into the grammar of design, letting them come into the foreground as inst instances of relational world making. 10, designing pluriversally aims to render the re-earthing of cities into plausible intellectual, political, and technological process by creating spaces of healing, recommunalization, and re-earthing that re-establish biophysical balance through a different urban metabolism. 11, designing pluriversally will have as a general goal, mobilizing for a new way of dwelling on the earth. 12, designing pluriversally could become an inspiring and effective key player in the civilizational transitions from toxic to healing existence. This reorientation will take a lot of work. Only slowly will pluriversal designers discover the considerable potential of acting from interdependence and care. So that's it. Thanks so much, Natalie and Cruz, for your wonderful visual work and for reading these last set of propositions. So we now give it back to Nora, okay. Thank you so much. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect. Thank you so much. This was really beautiful. Thank you all. Um, let me try to figure out how to, uh, perhaps Cruz and Natalie, if you stop sharing so we can see you and everybody else. Right. Let me see. Um, so this has been 
this has been truly wonderful. We have a few, um, we have quite a, quite a, uh, an, an incredible uh, attendance online and, um, and some people here in the room, although um, some of them already had to, had to leave us. Um, but what I'd like to start with is maybe uh, just ask you, um, Arturo, Cruz, and Natalie, if you had any uh, questions for each other um, or thoughts about, you know, the process, um, the relationship of uh, the contents you were working with, for example, Cruz and Natalie, to your design work and to your teaching. Um, but perhaps, yeah, we'll start with, uh, with you, Arturo, about this exchange. Okay. Well, the exchange has been relatively recent, so we didn't have too much time to work on it. But I was struck by how relevant and pertinent the images and the this visual design in general was in relation to the ideas. I have sent a short paper to Nora and to Cruz and Natalie. Uh, it was about, I don't know, 10 pages short paper that is going to come out in a journal called Eflux Architecture from the Netherlands, I believe. And just with that, they were really able to, to, to catch up, you know, with the with the ideas and and um, and show very well, you know, civilizationally. What I, the, the argument I was trying to, to make civilizationally show it with these amazing images, you know, including from painting, from films. So that's that's wonderful. And one of the things that also because I've um, been, been interested in film history for a long time is that their use of some films, film images, and we talked a little bit about that as well. But maybe my, my question for them now is, and maybe for Nora as well, what do this work, both in the visual and in the, um, I guess how to call it the narrative part, signify for architecture? I mean, do, how do you think, and, and this is a question for everybody really, I mean, I like to get some feedback, especially from those of you working in architecture and as practicing architects, what does it mean for you uh, these set of ideas for the practice of architecture itself. So um, I don't know if, go ahead, can, go ahead. You can jump in, can you hear us? Yes. 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 So I feel like in relationship to, to I think especially because the students are here right now um, and, and we've been thinking about the relationship to the land and how the history of a set settler, right? Like the settler history in the Americas, the fact that we are in a land grant university, right? And land grant has a really complicated history of land occupation. And all of those things in relationship to the role of designers to think about the future, right? Like how can future architects or like current practicing people think about their active role in some of the problems. So we are also generators of problems on one hand, right? Architects are really at the center of systems of extraction and exploitation, but also how can we use our collective intelligence to imagine possibilities of other worlds? As, as you mentioned, all these cosmologies and ways to understand how we relate to each other. How do we relate to other species? How do we relate to the non-living? is hopefully something that everybody can think about as we move forward in the sense that we, we have a finite space and we have a finite time uh, that we're here and perhaps we can think of other ways to interact with each other and to think about the future. I think that that would be something that we get really clear from many of the concepts you presented today and, and that have allow us to think and frame it and also to find names. What does it mean to re-earth the cities? What does it mean to think about the earth in relationship to architecture? I think it's really fantastic and hopefully useful for all of us. That's great. I'm pretty glad. 
Yeah, thank you. I also wanted to ask about, um, you know, the notion of the, of the larger transition. And maybe we could spend a little bit of time thinking about that um, in relation to maybe also smaller scales of, uh, of work that you, were, that, that you were referring to. But perhaps you can share a little bit of, you know, the, the, the idea of transition studies um, and your thoughts about kind of the larger transition and where all of this fits. Yes. So I started by talking about these three concepts, civilizational crisis, trans civilizational transitions or transitions to the pluriverse and relationality or radical interdependence. And the three of them to me in my mind go together. We, need, if we are in a crisis, we need to move through transitions and a new principle for thinking about transition, which is not new, but is re-emerging is this idea of radical interdependence as the foundation of life. So I do believe that, and this is one of the things that I do in the book, Designs for the Pluriverse, there's a chapter design, uh, devoted to, uh, quite a bit devoted to talk, talking about transitions, transition narratives, emerging from so many different places, not only from, you know, um, social movement activists and academics and intellectuals, but from spiritual leaders, from Buddhists, from ecologists, from feminists, from indigenous peoples, obviously, who are in many ways the most interested in, in moving from this system that continues to conduct genocide on them worldwide. Um, so there is, there, there is a field I, in that, I, that's the way I see it, of transition stories, and also a field of pluriversal stories. But these are not just fields that exist within the academy. And I always emphasize that it's very important to me that we understand, and that's everything I do pretty much, is, is located as a conversation between academic trends and trends in social, in political practice, in social practice, in activism, in what social movements are doing. My contention is that in many ways, it is the latter space the social movement space, broadly speaking, uh, very diverse, you know, anything from indigenous peoples to um, black peoples to trans, feminist, urban, rise to the city movements and so forth, that they are at the avant-garde in many ways of the production of new concepts because they are seeing life being destroyed right and left. We academics in a way are sort of a standing Detach because we, we, we academics also are pretty much the product of these dualist ontologies because we believe in observing in a detached manner. And most of us live, most, not all, in motherless uh, middle class enclaves in which we also are significantly decommunalized and the earth. So, so that, but, but. But then the, how, how does the academy becomes closer to that stream of life on the one hand, to the pluriverse stream of life, to life as interdependence, and at the same time becomes closer to this political spaces of where these things are being innovated with. So there is a lot, when I say that transitions are already happening, and this is, this is a, very common slogan in transition studies fields. Again, for anything from transition town to regenerative design, bio design, uh, degrowing, degrowth movements, common in movements, um, that all of the things that, that people do that go beyond the ontology of intrinsically existing separate subjects and objects that rational ontology, the calcula calculative or calculating ontology and rationality that Martin Heidegger and many other philosophers uh, denounce so much, that that's what transitions are beginning to happen. But what always is slipping back, there's a lot of a slippage. And this is the idea that we are trying to develop in this short book that I'm writing with Michal Osterwald. She's, a, she's an anthropologist at UNC and Kriti Sharma the biologists at Caltech, that there's always a slippage between, between trying to live more relationally and falling back into the ontological domain of man, 
secular, liberal, rational, individualistic, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because the world is so designed as to make the story of man be the dominant story, and the story of relationality is always struggling to be heard and to be harbored in different kinds of designing. So I don't know if that helps Nora, but that's what comes to mind. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat and I'll read um, one that just came in now. Is there a place in pluriversal designing to dialogue also with intellectual traditions such as psychology? I am a clinical psychologist. This is by Mary, Mary Wandre, which are also now in transition in the relational turn beyond their historically individualistic and modern roots. Yes, uh, definitely. And I don't know much about this, but increasingly I've been paying attention to a trend called eco-psychology. And eco-psychology, and the, I'm sure the person who has, uh, answered, asked the question knows much more about this than me, is a still, I mean, it's, it's very interesting because it's trying to come up with a different way of thinking about subjectivity and individuality and autonomy that incorporates more and more of the ecological dimension of life. But it's still within content with these ontological dualistic ways of thinking. Uh, but, and, and yes, I mean, one of the key, one of the key, I don't know if to call it targets because within the perspective of radical interdependence, there cannot be targets or enemies. It's an enmeshment where all in it, even with Brother Trump as Joanna, Joanna Macy. Joanna Macy is a wonderful, she's in her 90s already, Buddhist systems thinker and feminist activist and transition visionary that was making this comment yeah, in some event that it would be great if I could tell you about, about it, but I can't, was saying, well, yeah, brother Trump, you know, we're doing, yeah. I mean, it's politics without enemies. I mean, that sounds so weird, but yes, that means that we go beyond this ontology of separate subjects and objects. And we realize that we are all interdependent and interconnected. So we have to transcend this idea of othering even the enemy and build a different politics uh, around, around, uh, than, than that one. That doesn't mean that we cannot assign responsibilities and blame and bring these people to trial and control these people who, whose universal way of being is completely anti pluriversal And what I mean by that is that they belong and see the world only from their perspective, from the single universal rationalistic perspective. And they deny, in doing that, they deny the possibility of any other world to exist. And this is the way it's been tradition in the West. I mean, last night I was watching a documentary, PBS documentary about uh, uh, Randolph Hearst, also another important New York and California character, late 19th century through the first half of the 20th century, who couldn't see anything but from this world perspective and, and some of the commentators were very articulate about explaining that. What does it mean to just see the danger of a single story as um, I, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, uh, the great Nigerian writer calls it, uh, the danger of just seeing life from one perspective. So the, the individual I was, going to, I was saying should be one of, the, one of these constructs from modernity that we really have to deconstruct. And it's so difficult because we are constituted through and through as individuals. Historically speaking, the individual is a relatively recent invention. And still today, many anthropologists, for instance, argue that in regions such as you know, Papua New Guinea or the Amazon or with many indigenous groups, the notion of the individual, the modern individual as we know, it doesn't exist. People always exist in relation, in relation to the clans and the ancestors and plants and animals and spirits and gods and goddesses and so forth. But there is no individual to be found as such. And that's one of the great insights of Buddhism as well, obviously, that the individual as we know, it doesn't exist. There is no ego. That's what is called egolessness or trying to 
move away from ego attachment. So yes, there's a lot of work to be done there at the level of psychology and relationalizing psychology. That's we need to relationalize every single field of knowledge. Thank you. I also want to say and welcome. I mentioned earlier that uh, Miguel Robles Duran was uh, was uh, giving a lecture in two weeks uh, on behalf of uh, Cohabitation Strategies Urban Front, and he's here in the room. So I just want to make a sign, Miguel, in case you'd like to ask any question or make any observation. Just Great. give me a sign and I'll bring the mic. Yes. yes? Um, okay, so I'll bring the mic over to you. Um, thank you very much for uh, muchas gracias por tu por tu plática, Arturo. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Yes, of course. I have to speak so you guys can hear me. Um, I would love to um, continue to focus uh, a lot of the work that you're doing, a lot of the work that other people are doing in this concept of relationality, right? In my formation uh, as a Marxist theorist or something like that, whatever that, that means, we've always been exploring the concept of dialectics you know, from the very get-go, right? And uh, as I've been teaching um, uh, courses based on urban ecology, I mean, I'm always um, super like, excited the moment that I start uh, teaching um, the, someone like Carolyn Merchant or um, someone like Vandana Shiva um, and that come from a Marxist perspective, but that begin to, well, not begin, that basically determine uh, the future of understanding our ecologies as something relational, right? Um, and I'm always very surprised that it has taken so long for the positivist sort of sciences to break, understanding that this has been a situation of 150 years since, you know, dialectical thinking, relational thinking, even within the science, Einstein and all of that, you know, started to happen. Um, and I just want to, your perception on, 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 on the basis of the dominance of positivist thinking uh, in contemporary structures, of thinking and uh, and and what uh, what is your position on what should be done within academia on it? Because as academics, we know that is like the supremacy within most fields. Even though what we are talking about is just a little niche, so it's just a question in relation to that. Wow, muchas gracias, Miguel. There's a lot. There is lots there. Uh, maybe let me start with the last part about academia. And. I mean, I am of two minds about academia. Part of me says academia is part of the occupation forces, the ontologically occupation forces of people's lives and territories. Why do I say that? Because academia is the space where the experts are trained, the economists, the engineers, the scientists, the, even the anthropologists, the geographers, everybody, the planners, who then go on to occupy people's lives and territories with constructs and so forth. But then this other part of me, and this is one of the questions that is addressing from Latin American activists and social theories, can we decolonize the academy, academia? Can we contribute to an epistemic decolonization of the academy? What would it take for that to happen? And I think the academy will continue to be what it is as a whole. It won't be dismantled or change overnight, even less so now because it's becoming increasingly normalized through the neoliberal downsizing pressures of the academy. And we have less and less spaces and funds and, and fields of knowledge even to contest uh, that rationality of the academy because the humanities have been dismantled as well, and there are fewer and fewer positions, and which is really sad. That doesn't mean that the humanities per se are important in and of themselves, but the humanities with this new set of insights from dialectics to relationality uh, have been very important spaces in contesting the, uh, the, this dominant hegemonic, secular, liberal, rational, positivistic worldview and way, and way of doing science. In my way, in my, I mean, in my view, the strength of the positivistic mindset comes from the fact that it's wired into the 
designed world is because we think in an object-centered way with objectified knowledge and objectified life and objectify each other, that we design these systems that seem to be very strong, very sturdy, but that they're unraveling. They are nevertheless unraveling. And in a way we can say, and this is one of the things that this very interesting Chinese philosopher that's becoming well, more well-known, whose name is Yuk Hui, I'm gonna put the name in the chat, says is that, that there is a new, there's a possibility of restarting philosophy and thought in this space that is opening up today in between the, the triumph of modernity, because it has triumphed in so many different ways with through techno-scientific and economic rationality on the one hand, but also on the other, it's meltdown because modernity is also been, is unraveling as we know it. And then in that space, there is the opportunity for multiple beginnings, multiple new stories of life, going back to Thomas Berry's idea that we are in between stories and that there are multiple stories emerging. There won't be only one. I'm beginning to, I've been tracing one that is emerging from Latin America that emphasizes again, the more communal, territorialized, place-based ways of being, the importance of autonomy, deeper circularization, et cetera. But Yu Hui himself uh, argues that uh, the Chinese cosmology, if you wish, which is a more relational cosmology, can be the basis for another cosmotechnics, a different approach to technology different from the Western calculative, rational, instrumental approach to technology, but that can incorporate the Western, but without submitting to it. So there will be multiple stories and multiple beginnings. And to talk a little bit about the dialectic and Marxism. Yes, I mean, the dialectic is a, is a super powerful way of thinking. I always admire the great dialecticians. And, and at the same time, I think there is something new in this, in this relationality, especially because this new relationality incorporates some of the for, uh, emphasis on conflict and contradiction from the dialectic, but also in, 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 in a different way, not only because it brings the whole range of distributed agency and distributed consciousness that wasn't really there in Marxism, but that in, th in principle can also be and just to give you an example, there is now there is this really wonderful uh, explosion almost about the social life of forests and trees and plants. Uh, the fact that forests are being discovered to be these super organisms, super organisms that communicate through these in intricate mycelia and fungi structures under the soil, and that they are an, an, an entity that is alive. Uh, and that then consciousness is not just a prerogative of humans, but is distributed throughout the whole social world. In some cosmovisions, even inanimate beings have certain degree of consciousness like thunder or stones, like in some Native American cosmologies. So all of these different things are, can enrich tremendously a dialectical thought, which some of this is, is beginning to happen as I'm sure you know, Miguel, more than me, in the fields of ecological Marxism or Marxist ecology. Okay. Thank you. Cruz and Natalie, I want to ask if you had, if you wanted to add anything or um, before I move on to the next question, which I actually wanted to direct to you. Um, Sorry, it's that I was asking the students if they have any question, but yeah, I just have a comment because I see that there's many calls to Donna Haraway and stuff like that. But I think that many of the things that Arturo is mentioning exist. So they precede authors like Haraway and that there's so much publishing that is not happening in English that we have to be aware of because we tend to really focus on what is produced in American academia. And that's really problematic when we are talking about issues of decolonization. So I know that many texts are maybe they're not translated, but I feel like that tendency to refer to the same 
uh, Anglo Anglo speaking authors is really problematic when it comes to issues of of decolonization and inter in, uh, uh, relationability and so on that are mostly indigenous concepts too. Yeah, thank you. That's a great point, Cruz. Um, so I wondered, Lydia, if you wanted to voice your question or if I should read it. Uh, let me give me a sign. So a question from uh, Lydia Calipoliti is, how is the pluriverse differentiated or associated with other terms like entanglements, enmeshment, tentacularism, used by Haraway, Singh, et cetera? Um, and also with the pluriverse, what is the role of technology? Is technology naturally embedded or excluded from healing and caring and cohabiting the planet? Is the octopus an octobot or an octopus like we inherited from natural history? Uh, this is a question from Lydia Calipoliti, colleague here at Cooper. Um, and I think you know we can we can respond to this also with uh, Cruz's uh, uh, comment. Yes. So do you want to go ahead and complement your response, Cruz and Natalie? Would you want me to go? You can go now if you want. Uh, I think you can go and, and go ahead. Okay. So I think um, the social theory of the global north critical theory, social theory of the global north. So you include social theory worldwide because the social theory of the global north has per, per, permeated the global south. That's what you find as well in, in academic programs and the graduate to PhD in Latin America at least very much. Uh, coming especially from North America and the UK, I mean, sort of the English speaking critical theory. And it's, it's amazing. I mean, it's, it's brilliant work. It's, Quite amazing that work like obviously Donna Haro is one of the main. But I agree with Cruz, what Cruz and Natalie were saying that that in only referring to these authors, we are reinforcing that geopolitics of knowledge that always sidelines what is systemic from the global south. And especially in other languages, especially from other epistemic traditions, from other conversations, especially from activist conversations. So it's very important to be mindful of that that what emerges from the global north is still very much couched, even if it's pushing the boundaries of the episteme of the modern social sciences centered on man. And this I include the feminist theory, the more than human critical race theory. Nevertheless, it continues to bear the marks of that enunciation. For instance, some people ask the question of if multi-species discourse, uh, why, why don't, we, don't we need to examine carefully the human that participates in those multi-species assemblages? What kinds of humans are we talking about when we talk about the more than human? Are we talking about the colonized humans as well, who have always been represented as sort of closer to animals in some representations or not? And how does that change from the mostly uh, Eurocenter ideas about, about the more than human and multi-species. So all of these questions are super important. And in the same way, I think ideas about, so in a way, if we wanted to historicize all of this emphasis on assemblages and networks and so forth, we start with the lack of relationality, the lack of interdependence. So post-structuralism, Foucault, et cetera, great work, amazing work was about the conditions of knowledge, the connection between knowledge and power. Then we realize that we social theorists realize that there is much beyond that that is important for thinking about reality, especially questions of ontology. So ontology came in the past 20 years as an important perspective or domain for, for rethinking uh, reality and, and, and social life and so forth. And, uh, and, and with that came especially the focusing on the divide between the human and the non-human, the more than human anthropology, more than human geography, post-dualist social theory, the new material materialisms and so forth. So that is still fairly logocentric, meaning by that is still couched in a very rational abstract discourse. 
which is not the discourse that exists in many parts of the world, and this I think what Cruz was referring to, but in many ways are talking about the same ideas and sometimes even in more powerful and direct ways about life is relational through and through. We've known it. And in the struggles of people to defend rivers, but for instance, in Colombia, indigenous peoples and black peoples to defend rivers or mountains, because they are sentient beings, living beings, we find really a beautiful, very powerful expressions from grassroots people with our college degrees about how the humans are inseparable from river, from tree, from forest, from mountain, et cetera. And that's then, that's a different political ontology, it's political ontology that, that stems first from activist practice and then dialogues with the global trends in social theory, including multi-species and assemblages and so forth. So uh, one final thing, a first instantiation of thinking relationally was thinking in terms of networks or actor networks and even assemblages. In my mind, they still contain some of this ontology of separate, intrinsically existing or separate nodes or points or entities that then get connected through processes or lines. And the new kind of metaphors of like more enmeshment and mycelia and rhizomes and meshworks, self-organizing networks, I think they're trying to get and, 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 and come in, many of them continue to come from the natural world. Uh, again, from the new discourses about trees uh, and the mind of plants, so to speak, that are much more uh, attuned to that radical insights of relationality that come from many indigenous cosmologies, from Buddhism, from some his from history, Western philosophy as well, of course. And that's why people are rediscovering now uh, Whitehead and Berson and, and Spinoza and obviously Deleuze and Guattari. So that what comes to mind. Thank you so much. Um, we kind of have a, a hard stop at, uh, or had uh, at 1.30. Um, I wish we could keep the conversation going. There's also a, a a question about the worker, designer as worker, um, that uh, perhaps we can pick up another time. <laughs> but uh, this has been really wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for um, generously sharing. Cruz and Natalie, thank you also so much. I wanted to maybe just leave the, uh, the last word to you if you had any, any thoughts, both Arturo, Cruz, and Natalie. I think like uh, it's uh, fantastic, and thank you very much for the invitation. It has given us uh, like an like an a galaxy, a cosmos of uh, of uh, of terms and questions that we we hope to work with and keep on expanding in our practice and teaching, and and hopefully we can keep on the conversation not going. And same here. Thanks so much, Nora, and Cruz, and Natalie. Uh, I I am. Um, very much drawing to continue to learn from what you all are doing in these fields of architecture and visual fields as well. And it's really, really, really great work. And, and I think something's going on that is important and we need to keep attention to. Thank you so much. And also just a quick reminder, uh, Thursday at 6.30, we have Jeanette Sordi, part of the student lecture series and as part of this very series, and also I think we'll continue and pick up on, on a lot of the conversation today, uh, talk by Miguel Robles Duran, uh, representative of um, Cohabitation Strategies and Urban Front. Thank you so much, Arturo, Cruz, and Natalie, and everyone who was here and, and engaged with the conversation. Thank you.